There are legends of realms just outside of conventional reality, inhabited by magical beings. In the British Isles, some of these beings are known as fairies, or the Fae, or any number of other things. In certain mythological traditions, these Fae can be broadly divided into the Seely and the Unseely courts. The former were said to be fair and generally helpful creatures, while the latter were considerably more unpleasant. Broadly speaking, this duality can be seen in nature, that is at times pleasant and hospitable, while at other times it becomes rather dark and nothing short of terrifying. In a narrower sense, one can see this same curious dichotomy in certain groups of organisms. One such group is the Neuroptera, an order of insects that includes creatures like lacewings and antlions. The adult insects in this group tend to be elegant-looking creatures bearing wings that are intricately patterned with delicate networks of veins. They often have a slender, graceful quality about them, almost otherworldly at times. In contrast, the larval stages are nothing less than nightmarish, with appearances and habits that would not be out of place in the most feverish hellscapes of Hieronymus Bosch. The precise taxonomy of the Neuroptera has shifted subtly over the years. There are groups like Dobson flies, alder flies, and snake flies that have been considered to be a part of the order at times, but generally are not at the moment. This still leaves quite a diverse assemblage of creatures to look at, more than would be feasible in an exhaustive study. So instead, let us consider a few representatives, some highlights of graceful adults, and their often horrifying larval counterparts. In all fairness, even the adults in this order tend to be predatory more often than not. Still, they maintain a relatively pleasing aesthetic, at least. Indeed, some species seem almost otherworldly, with a strange sort of beauty about them. As for the larvae, there are a few unifying features that they tend to share within the order. To begin with, the life cycle of the Neuroptera is the same sort that one finds in other holometabolous insects, such as the beetles, flies, moths, and wasps. In other words, there is a pupil stage between the adult form and the larval instars. Because of this complete metamorphosis, the larval structure is often quite different to that of the adult. As with the other holometabola, the larval forms of the Neuroptera tend to be relatively soft-bodied. Although, unlike many groups, their legs are usually well-developed. Many species are capable of appreciable movement as larvae and lead quite active predatory lifestyles. The eyes, when they are present at all, are restricted to clusters of simple eyes on either side of the head. These simple eyes can detect overall levels of light, but they aren't much use for forming proper images. This is of little concern to such larvae as they rely upon other senses while hunting. One sense commonly used is a sensitivity to the subtle vibrations of potential prey walking nearby. This sense is particularly refined in the ambush predators within the group. It is not uncommon for some of these monstrous little larvae to have a series of fleshy tubercles extending from their bodies, each covered with bristles that may enhance these senses. Then again, such decorations may simply serve to aid in camouflage. The head tends to be fairly distinct and robust, containing extensive musculature. The overall shape is often flattened, to at least some degree. Extending from the front of the head are the mouth parts used in prey capture and feeding. The true centerpiece of these larvae is their rather unique mouth parts. These are plainly visible as a pair of rather grotesquely large pincers, often bearing several needle-sharp teeth along their inner margins. In fact, each of these scythe-like jaws is a dual structure, consisting of an upper mandible and a lower maxilla. Together, these two components form a channel between them that allows for the injection of venom and the extraction of the creature's sustenance from its prey. There are other insect groups that have similar piercing and sucking mouth parts, but these larvae are fairly unique in having this design combined within a pair of grasping pincers. 
it makes them all the more formidable as hunters. There are a number of other features that vary from species to species, and a few surprising tricks as well. First off, though, let us consider a fairly standard and straightforward form, as seen in the green lacewings of the family Chrysopidae. Not too surprisingly, most of the species in this family have adults that are green, and have wings, with intricate vein patterns reminiscent of lace. They tend to be carnivorous, with chewing mouthparts. They aren't especially powerful or agile flyers, but they manage to travel through the air with reasonable success. The larvae are relatively slender and streamlined, as such grubs go, with a prominent pair of pincers at the front. They are often referred to as aphid lions because of their habit of feeding quite voraciously on aphids. Their appetites make them reasonably successful in this endeavor, enough so that they are sometimes used as a means of biological control for aphid pests. In some species, these little aphid lions have the odd habit of affixing bits of detritus to their backs, likely as a form of camouflage. Thus, it is possible to see the occasional clump of dirt and refuse trundling along a plant stem, with a pair of menacing little pincers just barely visible peeking out from beneath the otherwise shapeless mass. In contrast to the aphid lions, many of the larval forms of the other neuroptera are ambush predators, rather than active predators. This can be seen in the Ascalaphidae, commonly known as owl flies. Somewhat amusingly, the scientific name translates quite literally into the owl family. While there is a degree of variety, adult owl flies often look like a somewhat unorthodox mixture of dragonfly and butterfly. The wings, like those of other Neuroptera, have a dense network of veins, and their overall shape is reminiscent of what one sees in dragonflies. The bodies are often fuzzy, and the heads have large eyes and prominent clubbed antennae that are often quite long. In contrast, the owlfly larva is a flattened creature with a body surrounded by a ring of fleshy tubercles, each covered in sensitive little spines. These larvae often bury themselves in whatever material is available in their environment, and wait patiently with their jaws open wide until something stumbles into range. From there, it is simply a matter of a rapid closure, a poison injection, and siphoning up the liquefied contents of the unfortunate victim. This relatively simple form of ambush is taken a step further in certain members of a closely related group, the antlions. This family, the Myrmeleontidae, has a similarly straightforward name to their owlfly cousins. The name literally translates into ant-lion family. It is honestly a bit refreshing to see a scientific name that precisely matches the common name. This tends to be a rarity in most taxonomy. The antlion larva is relatively well known for its distinctive conical sand traps, though only some species in this family actually construct such pitfalls. The larva itself is not often seen above ground, as it has a habit of burrowing into sandy soil whenever possible. The burrowing method is perhaps a little unexpected, as the antlion larva moves backward through the sand. Indeed, it tends to prefer moving backwards above ground as well, at least when escaping from the curious attentions of an aspiring entomologist. This backwards locomotion is not without its purpose during the construction of a pitfall. The larva will burrow just below the sand's surface in a slowly converging spiral. As it moves, it regularly raises its flattened head in a series of rapid twitches, flinging sand upward and outward. As this pattern continues, the conical pit begins to form with a slowly diminishing pile of sand at its center. When the larva reaches the middle, it settles in to wait, with only its jaws protruding above the surface. The approach of unwary prey is perceived by the larva, with mechanisms sensitive enough to detect the footsteps of a passing ant. If a creature of suitable size falls into the pit, it quickly finds itself at the bottom, and is often seized immediately in the predator's jaws. However, some prey is agile enough, or fortunate enough, to not fall immediately to its doom. In this eventuality, the larva will start using its head to fling sand upward again, trying to force the would-be prey to lose its footing. If successful, feeding commences. After the injection of a potent enzymatic cocktail through both of these pincers, the larva slowly slurps up the liquefying innards of its victim. 
Eventually, all that remains is a desiccated exoskeleton. Just an empty husk, lightweight enough to be easily ejected with another twitch of the creature's head. When the larva has grown sufficiently and passed through several molts, it burrows down a little deeper and begins to spin a cocoon around itself. This cocoon is roughly spherical in shape and inevitably incorporates quite a few grains of the surrounding sand. Within this inner sanctum, the creature pupates, undergoing the radical transformation into the adult antlion. The adult frees itself from the silken chamber and burrows upward and out into the open. From there, it will often seek a convenient twig or blade of grass to climb and extend its wings. The final result is a creature that looks quite similar to a damselfly, with a couple of important differences. First, the wings of an adult antlion are folded flat against its body. A damselfly is not capable of such a feat, and its wings rest above its back, pressed flat against one another in a vertical plane. The second difference, apart from a few subtle anatomical details, is the presence of a pair of short but quite prominent antennae. These antennae are distinctly clubbed. In contrast, a damselfly has only a pair of slender bristles for antennae. As strange as the antlion's larval life is, there are other neuroptera with still more unusual or convoluted existences. One that I am somewhat hesitant to bring up is seen in the larvae of the beaded lacewings in the family Barothidae. In many species within this group, the larvae are specialized predators of termites. They hunt the creatures within the narrow passages of their own nests using a highly effective form of chemical warfare. The larva emits a gas from its body, which paralyzes any termite that happens to be within range, making it into quite an easy meal. As it turns out, this gas is emitted from a very particular orifice on the larva. The curious investigator may be able to find further references to the lethal flatulence of these lacewing larvae. As for me, I am content to move on to the next monstrous little oddity. In the case of some Neuroptera, the larval form may be more parasitic than predatory. This is seen in some of the species of the family Mantispidae, the mantid flies. The adults of these species look quite distinctive. It is as though somebody took the head, neck, and front limbs of a praying mantis and affixed them to the body of a lacewing. There are subtle differences, of course, such as the lack of tarsal segments on these grasping forelimbs. In other words, the praying mantis can also use its claws as walking legs, whereas in mantispids, the lack of functional feet means there is no such option. Not that these little creatures are all that troubled over such matters. As it turns out, the larvae of certain mantispid species are specialists in feeding on spider eggs. There are a few variations of this particular strategy, but I will relate what is perhaps the most daring. Imagine a tiny, newly hatched larva with a form not unlike that of an aphid lion. This agile little creature seeks out a female spider, generally a hunting spider of some variety or another, and once it has found one, it climbs aboard the unknowing creature. After all, at this early stage of life, the larva is only a fraction of the spider's size and easily overlooked. The larva will ride for a time on the spider, waiting with an unnerving sort of patience. If it requires sustenance during this time, it will pierce the spider's exoskeleton to imbibe a bit of hemolymph every so often. It's small enough that the spider is merely inconvenienced. Possibly, if the size disparity is sufficient, the little larva may even crawl inside the book lungs of the spider. As the name suggests, these book lungs are respiratory chambers roughly analogous to the lungs found in many vertebrates. They are called book lungs because they contain a series of flattened structures reminiscent of the pages of a book. Such structures have a large collective surface area for effective gas exchange. For the little larva, these book lungs happen to be a perfect refuge. Eventually, if the spider is fairly fortunate, it finds a mate and lays a clutch of eggs. As is the common case with spiders, the eggs are wrapped up in a silken egg case to protect them from predators. This is no deterrent to the little larva. Quite possibly it insinuated itself among the eggs before they were wrapped up. Even if not, 
it is capable of finding its way through this outer wrapping. Once inside, the larva begins to dine. The mouth parts that serve its cousins so well in predation are more than adequate to get through the thin shells of the spider eggs. As the larva feeds on omelette after omelette, it passes through several larval molts. While its initial form was quite lean and athletic, these later larval phases are quite different. If anything, they resemble the rotund grubs seen in certain species of beetle. This grub still has its piercing, siphoning mouth parts, though, and makes short work of all of the spider eggs in due time. Eventually it pupates within the conveniently provided silken cocoon that was meant to serve as an egg case. Then, after a time, it hatches out as a fully grown mantid fly. As strange as this life cycle is, there is another form of parasite that is perhaps even more unexpected in this group. The spongilla flies in the family Ciceridae have aquatic larvae. The adult females tend to lay their eggs on leaves or branches above water, and the larvae fall into the water upon hatching. As one might guess from the common name, these larvae specialize in feeding upon freshwater sponges. That and freshwater bryozoans. The piercing mouthparts are employed to parasitically extract vital fluids from these sessile and relatively defenseless hosts. During pupation, the little spongillafly larva spins a cocoon that consists of two main layers. The inner layer is much like that seen in many other species of insect, consisting of a fairly sturdy enclosure of spun silk. The outer layer is far more diffuse. While details vary between species, it is often net-like and quite distinct and separate from the inner layer. The effect is something akin to a small pearl inside of a delicate cage. Last but not least, let us consider the family Nemopteridae. In the case of this group, the adults are at least as strange as the larvae. They have two pairs of wings, like all Neuroptera. However, the front pair is quite different from the hind pair. The front wings are much like those seen in lace wings, if perhaps a bit more broad. The hind wings are long and thin, and tend to drag out behind the creature as it flies. Within this family, there are two subfamilies. The Crocinae tend to have particularly narrow hind wings, while the Nemopterinae are more variable. Some species in this latter family have hind wings that are expanded into large flamboyant structures, which may serve to confuse predators or possibly attract mates. These more extravagant wing shapes have given the group the somewhat fanciful name of spoon wings. To return to the Crocinae, the adult forms are perhaps less impressive than those found in their sister group, but the larval forms are positively bizarre. The larva looks much like that of an antlion, but for one crucial and remarkable difference. The head of the larva is separated from its body by a long, narrow neck. In the more extreme species, this neck may be as long as the rest of the body. These almost hallucinogenic creatures tend to bury themselves shallowly in secluded places lurking just below the surface as they wait for prey to pass near enough. When they find a suitable victim, they treat it much as any ambushing larva might, securing it in their jaws, injecting venom, and extracting a liquid meal. All the while, the long neck keeps the prey well away from the soft, potentially vulnerable body. The neck is so narrow that it is just as well that the creature lives on a liquid diet. One could hardly imagine it being able to move solids down such a lengthy and narrow passage with any degree of reliability. The larvae of Neuroptera are most often nightmarish creatures, and one could scarcely imagine what they become when they reach adulthood. Still, their ugliness belies a rather effective body plan, as they tend to be quite successful hunters. There is a certain beauty in this efficacy, even if it is a strange and ruthless sort of beauty. So perhaps, just perhaps, in their monstrous way, they are every bit as lovely as their adult counterparts. This concludes today's little foray into the unknown. For those who are still curious, here are a few things you might try looking into further. If you found this enjoyable, by all means, say so. If you think others might enjoy this, by all means, share. 
If you're interested in seeing more of this channel, a subscription should prove quite effective. Until next time.